Good. So um, this was our problem that we talked about last time. Um, we have a function f that's convex, but not necessarily differentiable. And we talked about the most general method that we are going to learn probably um, the whole semester, which is subgradient method. It's kind of applicable whenever you can compute subgradients, which is very often. So it's a very general method. That's why we like it. It looks just like gradient descent. We just uh, take an initial guess, and then we repeatedly, from that initial guess, we compute a subgradient, and then we update within the direction of that negative subgradient. So just repeat these steps. xk is xk minus 1 minus some step size tk times gk minus 1, where gk minus 1 was a subgradient of f at xk minus 1. And we, we had learned that it's not a descent method necessarily, so we have to keep track of um, the best function value we've seen with respect to all of our iterates. So if somebody tells us to stop after some number of iterations, we would have kept track of that and which point gave us that best function value, and that we'd call that our solution, or our approximate solution. Um, so we talked quickly about the fact that um, in subgradient method, rather than in gradient descent, for example, we don't compute these step sizes adaptively based on um, the data we see. They're just fixed ahead of time. So one rule is to just have it be a constant step size. And the other rule is to um, choose them to satisfy these two conditions, which we just summarize as they're square summable but not summable. So the squares of the TKs, when I add them up, they're less than infinity. But if I add up the TKs themselves, then they diverge. So an example of that of a perfectly acceptable choice for that purpose is just to take tk to be 1 over k. OK. Um, there's not an analogy to backtracking in the subgradient method um, realm. So here was the results that we, we knew about subgradient method. And actually, you guys, if you had chosen to do problem four on this homework, you're going you're to prove both of these just from first principles. Um, the first result is that uh, if we take a constant step size, then in the limit, uh, our function value at the best point we've seen converges to something that's suboptimal. So we get less than or equal to f of x star plus g squared times t over 2, where t was our step size that we chose, the constant step size, and g was the Lipschitz constant for our function. So the assumption was that our function was Lipschitz with constant g. And if more, more, more than that, if we take um, step sizes that are diminishing in the sense that their squares are summable, but they're not summable themselves, so like this choice of step size, then we actually get a solution in the limit. Okay. So like I said, you guys proved that on the homework. Um, it, I have the, the, the basic steps here in the slides as well. The one thing we talked about at the end of the last lecture was that um, it's important to keep in mind, we talked about which functions are Lipschitz. That was kind of a helpful exercise. I'd encourage you guys to, whenever we come up with conditions in class, if we don't explicitly talk about them in class, think about when do they hold. Um, what kind of functions can you think of that either break those assumptions or meet them? And I just wanted to add as a kind of a footnote was that if you look at the proof of this, um, these results, we really only need the function to be Lipschitz on a bounded set, okay? on basically the set of all points that are within r of um, the minimizer x star, where r would say the distance between our initial guess and x star. So it's less stringent than you may think because of that fact. Okay, but always challenge the assumptions that we have for any of these theorems. That's a very useful thing to do. I mean, it's nice to have a mathematical result, but it's, it's even more important to think about when they apply um, and when they don't. Other questions? OK, so there's, there's one more choice of step size that I wanted to bring up. Um, it's called a Polyak step size. Or maybe, am I pronouncing his last name correctly, Barnabas? Um, actually, he's not from Hungary. Hungary? Oh. It's just his name. I don't know why, but it's from Hungary. 
That sounds Hungarian to me also. Well, then maybe somebody else can tell me how to pronounce that if I'm pronouncing it wrong. But yeah, so it's poly so in Hungary it would be polyak as well. Polyak. Yeah, but still I don't think it's Hungarian. So I'll say P step sizes. <laughs> um, <laughs> they they're they're like this. So what what looks funny these step size choices f to you if you look at this choice of step size? You can just shout it out. What looks funny? If anything. Yeah, that's not the optimal value of the function. So that's already a little bit weird. But it's not as weird as you may think because we're not actually asking for this minimizer, x star, just the optimal function value. And there'll be an example that we'll kind of breeze through really quickly that I'm hoping maybe the TA next week will cover in recitation in more detail where we know the optimal value of the function but not the minimizer, obviously, that's what we're trying to find. Um, but Polyak step sizes are, they are nice because um, they give us basically a, a convergence rate for subgradient method, which we don't really have so far. So they're impractical in the sense that we, if we were to apply them, we'd need to know f star, or f of x star, but if we could use that step size, then they'd give us a convergence rate. And in practice, some people even use the step size choice, but just estimate f star, f of x star, which is maybe, depending on the problem, it could be a lot easier than estimating x star itself, which is what we're doing. So um, what you can see is that if I plug this in, um, if, you go, if you plug this in and you go th through the bound we get here, you'll see that we get a an complexity of 1 over the square root of k. So co contrast that with gradient descent, where we got a complexity of 1 over k. Okay, so in the best case, when we choose these step size choices, which are already a little impractical, subgradient method converges at the rate 1 over the square root of k. The translation being that if we want um, to compute an estimate so that um, we're within epsilon of the minimum function value, then we need order 1 over epsilon squared iterations. All right, so compare this to gradient descent where we needed order 1 over epsilon iterations. And so that can be substantially smaller. And in practice, we'll see some examples. And you're, you're looking at an example on the homework next week where you'll run subgradient method versus a gradient-based ba method. It can be a lot slower in practice, too. OK, so here's a nice example where you do know the optimal value of the function. We're just going to breeze through it. Um, whoever is doing the recitation next week, I don't think it's been decided yet. Hopefully that TA will cover this in detail. But um, it's not super related to statistics and machine learning. It's just a nice application of the subgradient method, which is why we'll go through it quickly. So here's a problem where we want to find a point in the intersection of convex sets. We're given sets C1 through Cm. And all we want to do is find a point in the intersection. This could be something like we could want to run some minimization algorithm over the domain C1 intersect Cm. And we just need a feasible point to start it. So this could be like finding us a feasible point to minimize a different function over those sets. Or it could be for its own purpose. Maybe there's some other application where you actually just want this point. So in order to find that point, we can pose this as a minimization problem where we minimize the function f of x, which is the maximum over all i from 1 through m, that's indexing our sets, of the distance from x to the set ci. Okay, so if we're minimizing each of these, and I know there's a point in the set, then I'm going to be setting each of these to 0. Right? That's the smallest value that any of them can attain, which means that the point will be in each one of the sets. So if the optimal value of the function is 0, it tells us that we've actually found a point in the sets. Okay, so if we know a priori that these, their, their intersection is not empty, then we know the optimal value of the function at the solution. 
So is this a convex minimization problem, the one I've written down? Let's break it down into smaller pieces. Um, how about just this inner function? We'll call that fi of x just the distance between x and ci, which recall that if we have a set ci, it's the minimum over all, say, y in that set of y minus x in 2 norm. So it's the closest we can get to x from within the set. Is that a convex function? How many people think yes, just a show of hands? And how many no's? OK, so I think we're, most of us think it's convex. So why, why is it convex? We have rules for this kind of stuff, right? Um, OK, so I thought you were going to go a slightly different direction with that. But let's think, let's think a little bit more general. But let's think in a different direction where this is just a function of x and y. So is this a convex function in x and y jointly? It is, right? Because it's a linear function of x and y. It's just y minus x. And the L2 norm is convex. So the con a convex function of a linear function of some variables is convex. So it's definitely convex in, in x and y. And then we're minimizing over one block of those variables. And in particular, we're finding the minimum over convex set C. So we have this um, fact from the convexity lectures that if we ever minimize some function gxy over y in a convex set, if g was convex in x and y, and we minimize it over a convex set, then this whole thing, this whole function of x, which we'll call h of x, say, is convex. So that's what we're doing here, right? Convex function of x and y, minimizing over a convex set. So this function, f of fi of x, is convex. OK, so that's good. And now we're looking at the maximum of fi of x, i going from 1 to m. That's what our criterion was, right? And that's convex because it's the maximum of convex functions, another rule we know. If I take a finite number of functions, I take their maximum pointwise. At every x, I define my new function to be the maximum of all my functions pointwise. That's also convex. So this is a convex function, f. So if we could compute its subgradients, presumably we could just apply subgradient method. And then we'd find eventually some x star that's in the set, that's in the intersection of all those sets. Okay, so that's what this example goes through and does. And I will um, not show you any details. You can go through them if you'd like, and hopefully the TA will cover it next recitation. But just to let you know, we use the Polyak step sizes. So this is an example where we use those. And it ends up being a generalization of this picture. That's the answer. Where we just, if we had two sets, this is what the algorithm reduces to. We just start with a point, say out here somewhere. We project it onto one of the sets, the one that's farthest away. Then we project onto the other, and then back to the first, and then back to the second, and so on and so forth. That's called the alternating projections algorithm. It's a pretty famous algorithm f that people had studied from first principles. This does the exact same thing, but we actually know a lot more about it than we would had we just kind of thought of this on first principles, we can say that it converges, and we can say that at what rate it converges. Um, those are two things that we get automatically from subgradient method. OK, so go through that if you're interested. Um, so now I, I wanted to mention an even kind of more general version of subgradient method, which will handle um, convex functions over constraint sets. So if we have a convex function, we want to minimize it over C, which is some convex set. It may be determined by a bunch of constraint functions, for example, or it could just be a set. Then we could apply subgradient method, and then every step project back onto C. That's called projected subgradient method. 
So it's like we just apply the usual subgradient updates, right? We move in the direction of the subgradient, but at every iteration, we make sure that we stay within C. So after we compute that update, we project onto C, because we know that the solution has to lie in C. Um, we get the exact same convergence guarantees with this as we do with subgradient method. So with the same choices of step sizes, you get the same results. Nothing changes. What's another way, if I didn't tell you that we had projected subgradient method, what would be another way to, to minimize a function over the set C? If I had minimize f of x over C, and all you had was the subgradient method at your disposal, not project the subgradient, what would you do? Right, so I'd write this as minimize all over all of x of f of x plus i c of x. And depending on what c was, I could compute subgradients of this, right? Because we knew, we, we said that last time, it comes from the normal cone. OK, so this slide is just to tell you that um, there are lots of sets that are easy to project onto, but there are lots that are really hard to project onto as well. So things like an affine image of a set. So C is just um, the set of all AX plus B as I let X vary. That's easy to project onto. The solution set of a linear system is also easy to project onto. The non-negative orthant, so if I look at all points that are component-wise non-negative, I can easily project onto that. Norm balls can be easy to project onto, in particular for the cases, um, well for the case two it's very easy. For the case infinity, it's very easy. For the one norm, it's possible. There are actually linear time algorithms for that projection. And some simple polyhedra and simple cones, it's also easy. But you can think that you have a simple set C, and a concurrent projection onto C is very difficult. So for example, if I just write down an arbitrary polyhedron, so I take A and B to be arbitrary, and I ask you to project onto the set of all x for which AX is less than or equal to B, that's generically very hard to do. There's not an easy recipe for that. Okay, so you have to be kind of aware of that when you're thinking about applying projected subgradient method. You need to know how to compute this projection, which could be very hard if C was complicated. So what about the non-negative orthant? How would I project onto that? So if I had some point x and I wanted to project x onto c, where c was the set of all, say, y, such that y i is bigger than or equal to 0 for all i. What's the projection onto x? What's the ith component of this projection? Right? It returns me another vector. What's this ith component going to be? Yeah, it'll just be the max of x, i, and 0. Right, it'll set it to 0 if, if, I'm in the negative, in the, if I'm in the negative side of that boundary. Otherwise, it gives me the point back. That's one, that one's really easy. Um, how about the solution side of this linear system? So now if c is the set of all x for which ax equals b, what's the projection onto that? Um, it's just a, a, a linear space. No ideas. So how can I write this? Let me write this as um, a particular solution, x0. So x0 is going to be a point that solves that linear system, right? Plus what? What's that? Yeah, plus the null space of A. Right, that, that gives me all the points that satisfy AX equal B. Because if 
if this satisfies ax naught equals b, then if I multiply this whole thing by a, then I just get b. So if the null space is, is just contains the zero vector only, then the projection onto this always just gives me x naught. Right? That's just the closest point to any point, because it's the only point in this set. Otherwise, how do I write that? Oops. No ideas? Find B? V, okay. Such that? Okay, so projection onto X of C is the guy that minimizes argmin overall V of um, x naught plus v, no, x naught, how do you want to phrase this? x naught minus plus v minus x subject to v is in the null space. So it's really going to be x naught plus this argument. Okay, does that help at all? If you have the subspace of for position, like x naught, is there x naught? The position is going to be the uh, the limit where basically the element to which uh, square. So x naught transpose x naught uh, inverse x naught. If you write x naught transpose uh, x naught. Well, that's just a number, so that's just one over that. Uh, so, uh, I'm like, uh, x, x, x naught is a matrix, uh, like each column of it is uh, a, so a solution, so it's a, a span of x naught is or a solution uh, space. Okay, so you want a matrix whose columns form a basis for the exactly. solution space. So I call that B, okay? B. okay yeah. So B transpose B, B uh, inverse. inverse. X. Yeah. So that it would actually be that, right? Yes. That would be the, okay. So what's B now? So we're, we're close to having a closed form. Projection onto C of X is that. B is X naught plus the null space, right? So actually B is, um, we don't have quite a linear space, right? So to find the closest space in that affine space, what would we do? We'd subtract X naught and then we'd Add it back. Okay, so so what's B now? B is a matrix whose columns span the null space. Okay, so I can write this entire thing as the pr projection onto the null space of A. Right, so this could have been simplified to say that I project onto the null space of A x minus x naught. And I add to that x naught. That's that is what the projection onto c is. But um, this is i minus the projection onto uh, the column space, or say the row space of a, right? Because the null space of a and the row space of a are ortho complements. So if I project on the null space of a, it's like doing i minus the projection onto the row space of a. Okay, and what's that? That's um, going to be A transpose, A, A transpose, inverse, A, X minus X naught plus X naught. That's I minus the projection onto the row space. So this should be our formula for projection onto the solution space, just like this. And here I guess I'm assuming that A has 
full row rank. Okay, so in practice, if you're computing subgradient method subject to a linear system, you'd make your subgradient update, and then how would you compute this? This would involve solving a linear system, right? So that could be actually fairly expensive. A was a big matrix. So it could add a substantial amount of computational complexity depending on what A is, even just projecting onto the solution space of a linear system. Like it's computing A transpose, A, A transpose inverse A something is like solving a linear system. OK, so I wanted to give an application of this to the basis pursuit problem, because we've seen that problem before. Here's the first algorithm. Actually, it's the second algorithm that we have that can solve this problem. What was the first one that we had that can solve this problem? Hint if you've done homework one, question two, part A. So on your homework in question two, we rewrote this as a linear program. And we learned the simplex. So we could actually solve this with a simplex in linear program form. So we already have an algorithm for solving that. Here's our second one. It's just projected subgradient method. So the problem is to minimize over all coefficient vectors beta, the one norm of beta, subject to y equals x beta. So we're given y. We know it's a linear function of x, but we believe that it's a linear function of only a few columns of x. So we solve this problem, and it will select for us a, sparse, a small number of columns, because this will zero out components of beta. So let's do this in kind of uh, figure out what we do in chunks. So we're going to do beta k is the projection onto c. c is a solution set to this linear system of what we had before, beta k minus 1, minus tk times a subgradient of x at, um, of, of the one norm at beta k minus 1. So first, what are, let's figure out what this is, and then we'll, then we'll apply the projection rule. So gk minus 1 is a subgradient of the one norm at the point beta k minus 1. So what's that, from what you recall about subgradients? So what's the ith, what's the ith component going to be of gk minus 1? I know that you know it. Sine. Yeah, just the sine if it's non-zero. Otherwise, it's between minus 1 and 1. All right, so we just take the sine. Otherwise, we can pick anything between minus 1 and 1 as, a, as the value of that, of the component of the subgradient. Okay, so that gives us, that's the recipe for finding that. And then the projection onto C, remember we said that it was given by this form. So here for us, A is X and B is Y. So we have, um, let's see. So the projection, let's just say projection onto C of beta, we had from up here, um, that it's beta oh okay so we can do one more thing here before we um, get ahead of ourselves we can actually specify a form for x naught Right, let's, let's write out this in one more level of detail before we apply it. x naught was a particular solution to that linear system. Right? x naught was solved ax equals b. So somebody give me a solution to that if um, a has full row rank. So, well, there's too many people talking. Say it again. x naught is...
Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to rewrite that as A transpose A A transpose inverse B. Those are actually the same thing. All right, so I multiply this by A. I get A transpose times A transpose inverse. They cancel out, so I just get B. So this is a particular solution. So we can rewrite this projection just a little bit more nicely. Um, so I'm going to substitute in here. I get I minus A transpose A A transpose inverse A times X minus um, A transpose A A transpose inverse B plus X naught. Right, and now, or I guess I'll continue to write that as A transpose A, A transpose inverse B. So I get one of those from here, and that's going to cancel out with that one. I get right, minus that quantity, and I have positive that quantity. And um, now I get... Um, an x from here. And then for both of these, I'm just going to get an a transpose, a a transpose inverse x minus um, b. Right? So in other words, I get a, in front, I get an, uh, an x. And then I get a plus a transpose, a a transpose inverse. And then I get a um, right from this times this, I get two minus signs, and the A transpose cancels with, the a, with one of the A transpose inverses. So I just get this term left. So I get B um, minus X. B minus, thank you, AX. Okay, so that's the most explicit form we have for projection. So let's apply that down here. I get it's beta plus, for me, x, my a is my x, x transpose, x, x transpose inverse. Um, y was b minus x beta. So if I'm projecting this entire thing, so the projection of beta k minus 1 minus tk times gk minus 1, then it's going to be right, beta k minus 1 minus tk times gk minus 1 plus x transpose xx transpose inverse y um, minus x times this. So we get y minus x times beta k minus 1. Um, and I get plus x times tk times gk minus 1, plus x times tk times gk minus 1. All right, so, and what's that? Um, Somehow on the slides, I seem to have missed Y on the slides. Oh, I, of course. So beta k minus 1, what, this guy was feasible, right? By assumption, at every step, we're projecting back onto the set. So x times beta k minus 1 was y. Because that's like, it was a feasible point along our algorithm. So these two cancel. Okay, so it simplifies to just being beta k minus 1 
plus um, I minus X transpose X X transpose inverse X times TK times the subgradient. Okay, so that's our algorithm. It's going to just repeatedly take where we were and add something that has to do with which guys were non-zero by projecting onto the null space of X. Okay, so to implement this, again, this is trivial to compute, just to evaluate the sign. This requires solving a linear system in X. So if X was really structured, you could do that quickly. Otherwise, you'd have to be repeatedly solving linear systems in X. So it could be expensive. But regardless, we have, our, we have an algorithm now for solving the basis pursuit problem. OK. Um, so I'll just say this in words. Um, and you can take a look at this slide in more detail if you'd like. Some of the slides, and especially in the next set of slides you see, I include a lot more detail than we'll cover in class. Just because, in case you're interested, you don't have to go look through the literature or the details in the slides. Um, but you might ask, can we do better? So I, I gave you a very general algorithm for minimizing convex functions, um, assuming they're Lipschitz over some bounded set. And you could ask the question, can we do better? Is there a faster algorithm out there? We asked the same question for gradient ascent, and we didn't prove anything. I just cited a result that told us um, conceivably we could do better because um, we can prove a result on the lower bound, the fastest that we can do, and that was faster than um, the rate we derived for gradient ascent. For subgradient method, you can actually show that there is no algorithm that generically performs better than that one over root k rate. So that there's nothing that performs generically faster than subgradient method. If you are kind of um, bold enough to want to solve, uh, to minimize any convex function. So if that's your problem, just minimizing convex functions, you can't do better than we, what we have now. Okay, so formally, it's that the, the theorem states that if you give me a starting point, a number of iterations, then I can find a function that's Lipschitz such that any method that has updates like the subgradient method, in the sense that it, um, it updates within the span of the initial point and all of the subgradients we've seen, takes at least root k iterations to converge. Okay, so just to add an addendum to maybe what I said a second ago, this is a lower bound for what we're going to call non-smooth first order methods. So if all you're willing to look at is subgradient information, then you can't do better than what we have already. OK, so how do we improve? If it looks like we've kind of hit the, the limit for how well we can do, you might ask, like, where do we go next? Well, um, what we're going to try to do is solve problems that aren't quite as uh, general. We're going to consider functions that are convex still not differentiable, but that can be decomposed as a sum of one part that's convex and smooth, and another part that's convex and non-smooth, but simple. So maybe we'll say that the differentiable part can be as complicated as you want, but the non-differentiable part has to be kind of simple. And if we look at th this problem class, these are called composite functions, we'll see we can actually do a lot better than the subgrading method both in theory and in practice, a lot faster algorithms. And it has big practical consequences, because it means you can solve um, a lot of problems that might, you might see in statistics and machine learning that are of this form. So let's take a quick break, and we'll talk about that when we get back. The lecture notes that were posted for today. So, the goal for this lecture is to talk about two strategies. One is a pretty general strategy, and the other is a way to accelerate that general strategy. Um, and the motivation, as we just said five minutes ago, was that the subgradient method is nice, but it's too slow. It converges at a very slow rate, and in practice, it converges very slowly also. So today we're going to talk about something called generalized gradient descent. We're going to uh, talk about its convergence properties. 
you'll see that it has analogous convergence properties to gradient descent, which is a big win, because here we can solve problems that are much more general. Now we'll talk about the application of this algorithm to the lasso problem, which is like basis pursuit, but we just we don't say y is equal to x beta, but that y is approximately equal to x beta in some sense. And matrix completion. We'll see this algorithm applied to both of these um, problems. And then we'll talk about the special cases of generalized gradient ascent. That's why it's called generalized gradient ascent, because it generalizes a bunch of algorithms that you know already. And then I'll talk about acceleration. So this, um, for the purposes of the class, we're going to treat it as kind of like a bonus. If we get to it and we talk about acceleration, great. But it's not as fundamental a topic as generalized gradient ascent itself. So we'll try to see how much time we have. And as I said just before, these notes contain a lot of detail, these lecture notes. It's just because I wanted you to be able to um, you know, look things up if you're curious about having to consult the, the literature. But there's a lot of stuff we just won't cover in these lecture slides. So here's our setting. We're going to look at decomposable functions. f is convex and differentiable. h is convex, but it's not necessarily differentiable. And if this whole function were differentiable, remember, gradient descent would apply this update. We do x minus t times its gradient. And where do we get that from? We got it from this argument that we're going to make a quadratic approximation to f. Remember, we have this idea like, if we're here, we want to know where to go next. Let's make a quadratic approximation to f around that point. Maybe it looks like that. Let's minimize this quadratic. It moves us here. So that's what we'll be at the next iteration. So we could do this because f is differentiable. Remember, the quadratic approximation involved the gradient of f. And then for the Hessian part of that quadratic approximation, I just took 1 over t times identity. So that was the quadratic approximation to f. f was approximately f of x plus the gradient of f of x transpose y minus x plus 1 over 2t times y minus x squared. That was our approximation for f of y. So now we have f equals g plus h, right? This whole thing's not differentiable, so the same quadratic approximation idea doesn't really work anymore. But the perspective of generalized gradient descent is that, so let's call this quadratic approximation f hat. That'll be our notation for the approximation to f around x. So generalized gradient says, well, why don't we just do a quadratic approximation to g and leave h as it is? So I say this is approximately equal to doing a quadratic approximation to g, but leaving h as it is. Because we cannot make an approximation to it, at least not with the quadratic. So just writing that out, g hat of x, um, Maybe just so that I don't confuse you too much, I'll make all these y's. So now I'll make a quadratic approximation to g around a point x, and I'll call that g hat of y. That's this argument. So it's g of x plus the gradient of g at x transpose y minus x plus 1 over 2t times y minus x squared. And I still have h hanging around, h of y. So this whole thing is a function of y. So it's just like we said, just uh, expanding our quadratic around g and, and then adding h to it. And now, generalized gradient says, why don't we minimize this at every iteration and make that our update? So if we have x. We'll take x plus to be the argmin over all y of all this stuff. If we didn't have h, what would we get? Gradient. So this would be x minus t times the gradient of g. But with h there, it's different. Right? So. Um, Turns out we can rewrite that in a slightly nicer way. I'll just um, skip to the answer, and then we can check that it was 
by expanding it, we get the same thing. So I'll write this as um, x minus t times the gradient of g of x minus y plus h of y, 2t. So why are these the same problems? Well, um, anything that depends on x alone doesn't matter because it's a minimum over y, right? So it doesn't matter. So if I expand this out, I get x transpose x, doesn't matter. The cross term I get, or I get this whole thing doesn't matter, right? This transpose itself doesn't matter because it's not a function of y. The cross term is um, Actually, let's look at it slightly differently. So I'll write this as 1 over 2t, um, right, x minus y minus t g of x squared plus h of y. And now it should become clear. This thing squared is that. And the cross term, I get minus 2 times this. So the 2 cancels, and the minus flips around the y and the x. And the t cancels with the t in the denominator. So it gives me that term. And then again, this depends on x, so it doesn't matter. So we, these are really the same problem. And now I'm going to introduce some notation. I'm going to define this prox function. Prox, it's called the proximal operator. And it's defined in terms of h, and it depends also on t. And if you pass in a point x, Prox is going to return you the point z such that x minus z squared plus h of z is smallest. So what do we mean simple when we talk about h being simple? We mean that we know we can find this explicitly or calculate it explicitly. <laughs> Okay, so we'll talk about that in a second. But let's just use this notation now to, to represent this minimization. So it's the point z that's closest to x once I divide by 2t and I add h of z. And in that, in that notation, what do the gradient or the generalized gradient descent updates look like? x plus is just prox of h and t of x minus t times the gradient of x. Okay, Just like look it up here, for example. If that's the argument you pass to prox, then this whole thing is just prox of that. OK, so I claim this is the generalized gradient descent algorithm. At this point, um, you, may, you may think that I'm cheating, kind of, because all I've done is I've taken one minimization problem, that over x, and I've changed it into another one that I do repeatedly over z. So I didn't really accomplish much. So for a general function h, I've done nothing. Because all I've done is I've said to, make, to solve one problem over x, let's solve a sequence of problems over z. If h is allowed to be arbitrary, I haven't done any reduction because this could be a very hard problem also. But if h is simple, then it could be the case that this is solvable in closed form. And I've actually reduced the problem to a bunch of really easy steps. Even if g was very complicated, all I need to do is compute its gradient and then do a bunch of minimizations where I treat this whole thing as a constant. Right? This is just some constant, and then I minimize over z. So that's the intuition behind generalized gradient. Just written up on the board. We minimize repeatedly um, this proximal operator. So we'll just think of it as if we know it. So we, say we set x plus to be equal to prox of x minus t times the gradient of g. So said differently, if h was 0, what would these updates be? Yeah, so if h was 0, 
then the minimizer would just be z equals x. That's the thing that's closest to x, right? So prox would be the identity map. Whatever we pass in, it gives us that same thing right back. So these steps would be x plus equals x minus t times the gradient. So it gives us back gradient descent. That's one good check. Um, another thing that we'll do in order to make it look more like what we're familiar with, we'll write this as x minus t times some quantity, capital G, which depends on t of x. And we call this part the generalized gradient. And it's just defined to make this equality work. So in other words, I'll just define gt of x to be x minus the prox of x minus t times the gradient of g divided by t. So I'll just define g to be this. And I only do that so that I can make my generalized gradient descent updates look like they did for gradient descent. So it's like x minus t times something. That something is like a gradient. We call it the generalized gradient. OK, so a couple of things to point out. We already kind of said one of these, at least. Um, the prox function doesn't depend on g at all. So whether g is just a quadratic or g is a very complicated differentiable function, doesn't change the difficulty of this, of this prox operator. Because all I'm doing is I'm minimizing, call this thing a, for example. That's just a constant at every iteration. Right? I evaluate it at my current iterate. And then I minimize over all z, a minus c squared divided by 2t plus h of z. So I, I apply the proximal operator to, to a constant. So the, the com how complicated g is doesn't change how complicated the algorithm is in terms of implementing it. It should be just as simple as long as you can evaluate the gradient of g. And like we said, this is not really a good idea to do unless we know that such a proximal operator is tractable. But we'll, we'll see some examples of problems in which it is tractable, and it gives us a really big gain. So the convergence analysis that we're going to talk about, um, I won't go through the details of the proof. Just like subgradient method, I'm going to skip it. And it's going to be assigned as a homework problem on homework two. What is one of the optional questions. You can choose between that and the, and the applied question. But it's going to basically follow the same arguments as gradient descent, except it's going to use this in place of the gradient. That's another nice um, reason to write it this way, is that we can basically use the same gradient descent arguments and just treat this as if it were a gradient. We're going to have to prove that it has the same properties along the way, but it does. So we're fine doing that. So before I talk about convergence, I'm going to give you an example of where it um, is tractable. It's a good thing I brought a second pad. And that's in the lasso problem. So this is um, kind of a step up from doing basis pursuit, because it indexes a wider variety of problems. So we're going to minimize overall beta. y minus x beta squared plus lambda times beta. I meant to talk about the lasso problem when we talked about gradient descent in detail, like motivating why we'd study it. And I realized that we skipped over that part because we didn't do forward stage-wise regression. So it could be the case that some of you are looking at this like um, with the you know why is it important kind of look. But the two sentences I was going to say about it back in that lecture with it, it provides us a way of doing variable selection in the, in the linear model. So to think about it like basis pursuit, where we want to select variables. But instead of setting y equal to x beta, we're going to choose a beta so that y is close to x beta and beta has many zeros. And this lambda, this penalty parameter, it controls how many zeros we get in the solution. If I make lambda really small, then I place very little importance on choosing zeros. And I want to make y closer to x beta. If I make lambda very big, then actually um, I 
set more variables to, z to zero in the solution, and y will be farther from x beta. And you can show that as I let lambda go to zero, the limiting solution of the lasso criterion is the basis pursuit solution. So as I let lambda go to zero, it'll converge to something that right, places less and less importance on sparsity and more and more importance on fitting y to x beta. So eventually we'll get something that has y equals x beta and is still sparse. So let's think of this now as g of beta plus h of beta. So we want to minimize this composite criterion. And we're going to apply generalized gradient descent. So the first thing we have to do is figure out the prox function before we do anything else. Um, the prox function, right, is going to be it's a function of t. If I pass it some vector, um, I guess we'll just call it x, then it returns to me the vector z that's the minimizer of z minus x squared plus lambda times the L1 norm of z. So what is this? If I ask you these kind of questions, I probably shouldn't have the answers on the slide on the left. But <laughs> exactly, right. This is like doing lasso, but it's like this problem, but when x is i. And we, in the subgradient lecture, we derived that the solution to this explicitly is just take, why did I write a lambda there? That makes no sense. So it's 1 over 2t times that, right? Get a better eraser. It's 1 over 2t times that term. But I can multiply the entire criterion by t. It doesn't change anything. It's, the minimizer is going to be the same. So I can write it as 1 over 2 times z minus x squared plus t times, and there should be a lambda here, right? Because my h function was lambda times the L1 norm of z here. Okay, so that's the prox operator. And we derived last time with subgradients that we know the solution to this explicitly. It's just take, let's just take um, x and let's soft threshold it by an amount t times lambda, which was the multiplier there for the L1 norm. So right, in every component, we just either, the formulas here on the board, we just subtract off lambda if its argument's bigger than lambda. Otherwise, we set it. Otherwise, we add lambda if its argument's smaller than minus lambda. And if it's between minus lambda and lambda, we set it equal to 0. So this is an example where no matter what g was, it doesn't matter how complicated g was, it could involve log and exponential and anything else to make it complicated. As long as it's differentiable, the prox operator is always soft thresholding. And all we have to do is that we take our beta, and it, in generalized gradient, we, we apply prox of x minus t times the gradient of g, of the previous iterate. This should be a beta. In other words, we just soft threshold it by an amount lambda times t. And what's the gradient of g here? So in our particular case, we have g as the least squares loss, so its gradient is gradient of g with respect to beta is should be automatic, hopefully, for most of you guys. What's that? G. G is this part here. Oh, sorry about that. 
It's the L2 norm of y minus x beta squared times a half. So what happens if I didn't have the x there? What would it be? Okay, it would be y minus beta if there was no x. So now there's an x. It's like I do the chain rule, so I do x transpose y minus x beta. It's actually negative then. That's the gradient. Hopefully you guys were just tired after um, 70 minutes of lecture, which is a long time. So I plug that in here, and I get uh, beta k minus 1 plus tk times x transpose y minus x beta k minus 1. So now you can see that according to our algorithm, it's actually going to set components of, it, of the iterate, the guess, our guess of the solution to 0 at every iteration. Right, because if components of this are less than lambda times t, they'll set it to zero. So any time we stop the algorithm, we will get a solution or an approximate solution that has exact zeros, right? Just from the soft thresholding function. And this is very cheap to apply. Right? Think about what you're required to apply if you implement this in MATLAB or in R. You just need to take an inner product, so that's um, order n time here, right? And I suppose you need to do a, a matrix multiplication as well. And then I just go through each component of that when I add these two things together, and I check whether it's bigger than lambda times t, or whether it's smaller than minus lambda times t, or whether it's in the middle. And I just have an if statement that sets it equal to 0, or subtracts or adds lambda to it. So every iteration is very fast. And you can see how it performs compared to the subgradient method. We could have just approached this from the perspective that, hey, it's a convex function. We can compute its subgradients, right? Because I can compute the gradient of g, and I can compute subgradients of h. So I could have applied subgradient method as well. And here's a plot of a typical run of these two when I implemented them. At where it is in terms of f of xk minus the minimizer, minus the optimal criterion value, f star as a function of iteration. So the y-axis is the function value at the current at a given iteration minus the bet, the minimum. And this is iteration count. And you can see that here's subgradient method trotting along. It's not even getting that close to the minimizer, right? It's still within 0.3, looks like around that of the of uh, suboptimal from the minimizer. This is a log scale. So you can see that um, generalized gradient totally dominates. Right? And there's not even really a hope that we'd get there anytime soon with subgradient method. So it's a really big difference in performance between the two. So this uh, convergence analysis is going to solidify that empirical observation, which is going to say that when we run generalized gradient descent, assuming we can actually evaluate that prox operator, which we could in this case, right? It was just soft thresholding. So in cases like this where we can evaluate the proximal operator, we're going to get the exact same convergence guarantees as we did with gradient descent. In that it's actually, you can check, it's even the same constants. And it's the same, um, the same bound exactly. That after k iterations of gradient descent, of generalized gradient descent, will be within where we started over 2 times t times k, where t is the step size, as long as t is less than or equal to one of the Lipschitz constants of the smooth part, g. So if g has a um, gradient that's Lipschitz with constant l, we take the step size to be less than or equal to 1 over l. It converges at the same rate as we would if the entire thing were smooth, 1 over k. So that's a very reassuring result. It's a big win, like I said, for um, generalized gradient because it enables us to solve a bunch of problems. The one thing to keep in mind is that um, this counts the number of iterations and not operations. Right, so I'm, I'm counting the number of iterations by saying that it, it goes down like 1 over k. But if the proximal operator were complicated, it might be actually very costly to apply this. In this case, it wasn't. It was just linear time. 
So it didn't really add much. But you could imagine that evaluating the proxima operator itself is a pretty complicated operation. All that's being counted here in this bound is how many total iterations I need. Each iteration evaluates the proxima operator once. So in some cases, even though it has the same convergence rate in terms of number of iterations, it could still take a lot longer than just a smooth problem if this proxima operator is complicated. And we'll see an example of that next time with matrix completion. All right, good luck with the homework. Uh, make sure to turn it in, and we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>